Welcome everybody to the second edition of our EVM expeditions. At White Rocket, we have multiple sessions and meeting types where we share our knowledge with each other. Uh, some of these are now also public. We have our Share Friday format where we each other Friday, uh, some of us yeah, talks about one topic that he or she is especially interested in. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be related to tech or EVM specifically. It can be anything like a cool hobby. And for the more specific types, we have our EVM expeditions where we kind of go through everything related uh, to the EVM and the broader blockchain ecosystem. Today, Felix is going to be talking about proxies, beacons, diamonds, and everything in between. And without further ado, I would say, take it away, Felix. All right, then I'm just gonna jump in. Um, so uh, today I'm going to uh, um, give you an introduction of of how the diamond uh, pattern basically came to came to be, and I'm I will be run through some predecessors uh, in at some point and explain how they um, yeah how how they are structural um, yeah how how their structure basically leads to the diamond pattern at some point. And uh, and uh, at a later uh, stage of time, I'm going to go into how to combine um, the so-called beacon pattern and the diamond pattern together. All right. Um, so if we look uh, at these uh, patterns that I will present, all of them have um, a few things in common. And the main um, the main point here is the combination of the so-called so-called delegate call and the fallback function. The delegate call is basically you take your, like if a contract uses delegate call to call another contract, um, it instead of using the state of the called contract, it uses its own state. So there are some, um, some implications that can uh, are happening here that I will go over um, with, the, with the other uh, patterns here. The, the other main function that is used is the fallback function. So if a contract, like if I want to call a contract as a user and the, the contract doesn't fulfill the function that I called uh, in this contract, um, it basically falls back to this fallback function. So everything gets uh, run through here. If there's no implementation happening, it, um, it should just revert, um, ideally. Um, okay, so let's go through the different patterns um, to see what, what I mean by um, all of them use delegate call on the fallback function. So all of these, these patterns have different problems that, that they try to tackle, and I'm going to run through them um, and explain how they try to answer them. So for the first one is the main problem. Um, how to repeatedly deploy the same contract with minimum gas costs. I mean, the, this is a pretty common problem. Um, we have basically, we have an implementation um, that we want to duplicate at some point for, for different users, and it would make sense to reduce the gas cost of the implementation with itself. So um, in a normal uh, deployment, you would basically say, okay, I have my implementation here, I'm converting it, um, into bytecode, and then I'm going to push it to the um, to the uh, blockchain. The the problem here is if my implementation is pretty big, um, that's going to cost a lot of gas. So instead of you sending the bytecode for for the specific contract over and over again, I create a minimal contract that just references this real implementation and redirects calls via delegate call to it. So it's basically a user calls. Um, then the, the so-called proxy uh, uses the fallback function and delegate calls into the function of the boilerplate. Um, right, there's also an ERC standard to it, ERC 1167. Uh, um, that one is, is uh, optimized to, to use as, like the, the bytecode is optimized to, to use as 
uh, less as possible. Like you don't, it, it's it's really minimized. If I, if I click into it, you basically just upload this bytecode with a few extras, and that's the whole whole contract that you create as a minimal proxy. All right. Uh, now let's jump to the next problem. How can I upgrade my contract without changing state? So um, what, another big problem that we have on the on the black chip or problem feature. Uh, um, yeah, if you look at from different points, it it has different advantages or disadvantages. But contracts that we upload to the um, to the blockchain itself themselves are immutable so we can't change them but what happens if for example i upload a contract and discover it there's a bug hidden in it and the bug could be exploited and the um like the funds i i have in the in the contract could be at risk so um there there's a fundamental um like i want to to make sure that my my contracts are uh, say for the future and so there should be a possibility to upgrade them um, so how can i do this um, without changing the state so i have funds already in the contract locked and i still want to up update the implementation um, the solution would be here to separate the state from the implementation from each other and how do you do that uh, i mean you can guess it i, I pointed it out before you basically create a fallback function that delegate calls into the next contract um, yeah, so the proxy contract itself basically has the state of, um, that you want and just delegates call to redirect to the correct implementation. Um, we could change, like if you want to upgrade the contract, you, we just say, okay, you now point to the um, upgraded implementation. Um, it's pretty similar to the, to the minimal proxy, um, but it, it's not hard coded uh, which implementation uh, where where the implementation basically is so the structure would look like the user calls we fall into the fallback function in the proxy and we internally ask for the implementation address and then it goes uh, by a delegate call to the correct implementation if you want to update the implementation we just say okay we're going to call the function for it and it updates the implementation address all right to the next problem um Let's imagine we have a rollout of contracts that we copied via the minimal proxy factory, um, and we discover, oh fuck, there's uh, there's a bug in the code. Um, so they they might be thinking like, okay, um, maybe I can upgrade uh, these contracts single at a time, but not all of them at once, and that is also a problem. Um, and that's where. Uh, this, this question comes, how can I upgrade a lot of contracts at the same time? Um, so the solution here is pretty similar to the proxy, but uh, like, like the, the structure that, that I mentioned before, but instead of internally asking for the implementation address, we do it externally. So we basically have a pointer that just says, okay, here's the implementation, and all of the, the uh, uh, proxies just um, have this uh, pointer basically as a reference. So if the pointer changes its uh, implementation, um, all of the proxies basically change the implementation. Um, so the structure here would be also user calls, we go into fallback, we externally ask for the implementation address, and then we delegate call into it. Um, and basically uh, in that way, we have the implementation. All right. Um, now to the uh, um, to the diamond pattern. The diamond pattern, um, the problem it tries to solve is how can I combine multiple contracts into a single one with a single state and still avoid storage collision? Um, it's a more complex uh, question, I admit. So we can basically uh, split it into two different questions. The first one would be how can I forward calls to correct uh, to the correct function if I have different contracts that I want to um, go through. And the other one would be if I have multiple modules or contracts um, that are called via delegate call, how, um, how do I safely um, remove the problem of storage collision? 
So if if I example uh, like like I want I am a contract and I will delegate call into contract one like an example contract that has at the storage position one an address for example. So with my delegate call, I basically try to interact with the with the address on uh, on the storage position position one, and because it's delegate call, I um, I basically save this this uh, storage slot for this address. But if I then delegate call into contract two, for example, that also has something on the first position, um, there there's this so called storage collision where we have problems um, that. Uh, one contract uses this position for this data and the other one for this data. And there, there are some solutions out there. For example, we could uh, basically create blank space in these uh, implementation contracts where we say, okay, don't touch this space. This is reserved for, for other modules. Um, but th that has a lot of um, like a cognitive overlay in them because uh, we have to go, we basically as developers have to go through and say, okay, this space is for this one, uh, for this implementation, and that one is for this. And it gets complicated very fast because like, like if, if you have a lot of modules or contracts that have to work together, um, there's a possibility that you mess up. Like um, at some point, th there's always problems with that one. And yeah, how, how do you solve that one? Okay, uh, let's let's uh, go over the, the problems we fast again. How to forward to the correct function and how to um, avoid storage collision with multiple contracts. So for the first problem, how to forward uh, the call to the correct function and contract, it actually takes um, the same structure that we had before. So um, the user calls into the contract, we go to the fallback, but instead of asking externally, um, for example, like the beacon pattern, we just say, okay, um, the, the, with the call of the user, he gives us um, a function selector. A function selector is basically an abbreviation of the function call that says, okay, which function do I want to call? And um, with that's just four bytes. And we could basically say, okay, if this function is called, we're gonna um, forward it to this contract. So we have contract one and contract two, everything from uh, like every function in contract one goes to contract one and every function in contract two goes to contract two. Um, so we basically just create a mapping basically um, that allows us to forward to the correct position. So, so the structure would look like this. Uh, the user calls, um, we go into the fallback uh, function of the diamond contract, and we say, okay, he wants to call this function. So we convert it to the function selector, and we have a map mapping from selector to the implementation address. And then we input it there, and then we have a delegate call to the correct function at the correct position. So it's it's pretty similar to the to the other structures, but uh, we basically do it via mapping. Um, that that means um, we have to uh, basically include all of the function selectors of the included um, functions from the other contracts, but. I mean that's doable, right? It's it's not as automatic as as the beacon or the proxy, but it's still comparably easy, I would say. Okay, to the next problem. Um, that's what this one is actually pretty spicy. How do we um, avoid the storage collision um, locally uh, on the base contract, so on the diamond contract, and um, we, we avoid collision? Like how how do we do that? Um, so, if we to take a look at uh, Keka caches, like we um, we say we we have a unique value, and we Keka cache uh, make a Keka cache out of it. That's basically from a, from from a math assumption. That's pretty much a predic uh, practically random thirty type uh, thirty two bytes number. So it's a it's a random. Uh, number in, in 32 bytes. That's like, 
I think I, I run uh, through it before that's um, 10 to the power of 77 uh, different possible numbers, which is pretty high. And um, we say that each module has to create a distinct Keka cache. How we do that, I get uh, later down the line. Um, but each of the module creates this hash, and we say um, he gets a storage slot at this hash, hash position. And then what we do is basically we create a struct that from now on serves as the storage slot um, of that module. And why does this work? Because we can assume that a random 32 bytes number is like, like we have module one and we have module two, and each of them has a random 32 bytes number. Then we can assume that these uh, both of them are practically far enough away from each other to never overlap because like 10 to the power of 77 is that's gigantic. All right, so so that basically um, solves the problem. We we just instead of of uh, storing storage locally, we we always say we we're going to reference our storage slot via the struct. So how is this implemented? Let's have a look. So for the for the diamond, um, let's go with the fall border um, first. So we basically have, as I explained, we have this fallback function that says, OK, um, we want to forward it to the correct position. And how do we do that? We take the message signature. That means the, the function call. And then we put it into uh, the mapping of the function selectors, which gives us an address back. And from that point on, it's, it's like every other proxy too. We just say delegate call to that address and then we re return values based on that. So it's pretty simple. So um, how would you add another uh, contract? You just say, OK, we have the function selectors of the contract. It's just a byte array. And we say, OK, what is the responsible contract address? And that would be like, and then we just put it into the mapping. It's pretty simple, actually. So short moment. All right, so now to the spicy um, structural part. Uh, let's go to that one. So um, what I did here is basically as a, uh, I created a module for the for the diamond, right? As I explained, um, the storage is now a struct basically. So we have this struct called state. I mean, I just called it that way. Um, and what we do is we say this state um, always is accessed via this access state function. And um, how do we get the position of the of the struct? We use the slot function. It's it's in in here. Um, and the slot itself is just a Keka cache of a unique identifier that. Um, basically each module has to implement. Um, in this case, we used, uh, we said, okay, we have a major version here and we have the unique um, string that each of the modules ha has to be distinct. In this case, it's it's a GitHub uh, link, basically. Each of, or each of the GitHub links are unique. That means the Keka cache itself should also be unique. And that's it. You basically um, always access the struct. If I want to change storage, I have to always go through this one. So if I have these functions set data v1 um, that wants to set data, we basically save the struct into storage here in the function, and then we um, overwrite it. Right. So um, yeah, maybe you noticed that above the Above the functions, um, I included the four bytes function selector. It's basically, um, let's see, I did it somewhere here. Uh, it's basically you uh, you make a hash 
of the, the function that you have, and then you cast the two four bytes. <clears throat> yeah, so an example would be uh, like this one. Uh, we have the transfer function that gets an address and a uint. We cast the two bytes, then we uh, uh, do a kekak uh, of that one, and then we cast it, cast it to bytes four. And then we can input it here. All right. Um, the, I think that's the main, um, like, like what what the diamond pattern itself is is uh, or consists of. It's basically two these two problems that it tries to solve. Um, the first one uh, to to forward to the cor correct contract, and the second one how to avoid storage collision. So in the next next section, I would go over. Um, how I uh, combined the diamond pattern with the beacon pattern. So, um, um, okay, let's see. Um, so, so basically what it tries to achieve is how can we update a lot of diamonds at the same time, or one of the implementations of the diamond uh, at the same time. Um, yeah, from... If we if we take a look at the beacon and the diamond um, pattern, they they ha have a lot of uh, structural similar similarities. I would say um, both of them basically look up the implementation address and call into it via delegate call. So uh, I made this little meme here where where implementation. Um, it basically if if we look into it into this little graphic. We have a call, it looks up the implementation, and then it calls the implementation. Um, in this case, um, you may notice that uh, the beacon proxy, as well as the diamond, each have the, their individual storage. So if you want to combine the bo uh, both of them, um, the first assumption could be that we just link up the structure, right? So we, we basically say, OK, the diamond points to the proxy contract, and then the proxy contract basically points to the implementation with the added beacon at the side. Um, that also was my first uh, thought process. The problem here is with, with the use of the delegate call function, we basically can't access the, um, the implementation of the beacon. Like if we, if we deploy the beacon proxy, um, we would say in the constructor, uh, constructor Okay, here's the beacon you want to uh, to see, and we would have to update it um, because all of the all of the calls from the diamond are via delegate call, right? Uh, the like uh, the storage of the beacon um, can't work with the storage of the diamond simultaneously. Um, so all of the storage would have to be in the diamond pattern itself. Uh, but how do you do that? Like, um, <clears throat> how do you integrate the the beacon, um, basically? So the solution here is is to see the beacon as an and an as an individual module, basically, that we also call um, via the the module functions. So we would, um, if I jump into the example. We basically say, okay, we have the same structure as before, that, like we have the diamond, we have the module, um, but uh, for the beacon proxy, we say this is also a module. So we have the state where we say, okay, we have the beacon address um, that we want to point to, and we have this um, all of these access state functions that we needed before, identifier, all that stuff. And we have this fallback function, basically. Like that's the main point of the proxy, right? To to fall back, and then we um, basically point it to the correct um, to the correct implementation. And that what and, and that's basically what happens here. So um, instead of doing the implementation via storage directly in the proxy, we say, okay, you get it from from your state struct. Um, 
maybe an interesting side note here, a problem that I found uh, was, was challenging from a, from a thought perspective was, okay, so if, if our original diamond contract calls into the beacon proxy that calls into the implementation, both of like uh, the diamond as well as the beacon proxy use their fallback function. But if I use delegate call, we basically always run from the state of the, of the diamond, right? So later down the line, which fallback function do, do I really use? Like both of them um, use, use their, their fallback function, right? So the diamond would call by a delegate call into the beacon proxy, and the beacon proxy would use its fallback function to use the implementation. But because everything basically um, is settled in the, in the diamond um, contract, and because it uses delegate call, does it call its, uh, its own fallback function or does it call the beacon proxy fallback function? And I did some testing and it actually um, uses the, the fallback functions of the correct contracts that are used in this case, because you, you basically cast um, yourself to the to the contract that you want to use, and um, in, if that contract uh, has a fallback function, you use that fallback function actually, um, right? So for for if a user would have this chain, basically user the diamond the beacon proxy then implementation, um, it would work uh, as the following. So if I call into the diamond, I would get a diamond function back. If I call into the beacon proxy, um, I use the diamond fallback and get into the beacon proxy function. And if I want to call into the implementation, I would call into the uh, diamond fallback, then into the beacon proxy fallback, and then into the implementation. Right. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. Um, it took a lot of uh, experimentation to, to gather to this point because there were some uh, logical uh, structures that I had to run through. But I think all in all, it's pretty interesting just to, to get this point of view into it. Um, yeah, I created, a, a, like I did the different implementations um, for the different use cases. So uh, I also have a beacon structure where you can just look into and I wrote some tests to it. So uh, maybe not interesting um, for the diamond. If, we're, if I went for an implementation, it would look something like this. Um, if you remember, we have to use the correct function selectors in here. So um, I basically created a, an array of the module that I wanted to use. For example, uh, if you re remember set data v1, um, and get data b1 was the like the implementation of the uh, uh, of one of the implementation contracts that I used, and I converted them to the correct function selectors and then added them as a module in here. So it's basically the same structure. Um, maybe interesting to see is also I did the same for the. Um, for the uh, <clears throat> uh, for the for the beacon, obviously, and how you would initialize that one is uh, interestingly um, is it that you instead of uh, referencing the full-on implementation like um, like that one, let's see. Um, like that one, we are we always point if if you want to reference this implementation, instead of saying okay, I'm going to point directly to it. We use the beacon. So um, everything that this implementation uses, we have to point always to the beacon. Um, yeah, and also use an uh, any let's, let's see um, initialize function basically to uh, make sure that the beacon proxy itself can uh, point to the correct address. Um, can I ask a question at this point? Yeah, sure. Uh, so you have this um, yeah. value over here. 
uh, is presenting like a hash, this hex uh, value, which you have right now. That one? That one? Mm -hmm. This is like a hash of a, of a contract, a function. Yeah, you could see it that way. It's the it's the function selector. So um, I have a link up here. Let me quickly run to it. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, so it basically is um, Keka cache of the of the byte version of uh, the function, like the the string of the function, and you you take the first four bytes of that hash. And that's the uh, um, the function basically. Right, so, so so I basically ran man, I manually ran through all of the the functions that I wanted to implement, and uh, each encoded them individually to get this this number uh, or this hash basically or these four bytes, and um, that's what I put into here. So this references set data v1 and this references get data v1. All right, yeah. Um, yeah, like uh, there's there's also an official standard for the for the diamond itself, um, which basically is is like the version I presented to you, but on a super refined level, right? So they um, they they make usage of how to better integrate modules and remove them and upgrade them and stuff like that. Um, it's I, I just wanted to basically break down the diamond as at a uh, at a low level as possible because it uh, I I think it's better to understand that way, right? Because it's um, Otherwise, it's pretty much overload. Um, yeah, there are like uh, a lot of reasons listed why why the diamond pattern itself is is pretty nice. Um, but I also stumbled like on my uh, way working through it. I also stumbled upon um, some some things that that have to be um, kept in mind for it to be, to be used. Yeah, like on the good side, um, you basically. Uh, solve the problem that a contract can max uh, at a maximum have 24 kilobytes of um, of size. You can use multiple contracts at the same time. Um, all of them basically use the same address to to do stuff. Um, you can organize your code very efficiently. I would say stuff like that. It's it's a lot to to take in. Um, but on the negative side, for example, uh, I, I, I thought about ways that that I could break the system. If if I for, for example say I I have a module right that um, that somehow got into the diamond that I want to infiltrate, the thing is because my module represents basically the diamond itself because all of the diamonds functions. Um, called by a delegate call, right? So, so if I say, um, okay, I now want to transfer all my funds to this malicious address, I can just do so because if the function of my module is ever called, um, there's no access control in regards of of uh, token transfers, for example. Um, that's a that's a huge is issue, um, or. Yeah, there, there are a few few things that have to be kept in mind um, in in that regard. So it's it's ups and downs. Yeah. Okay. Do do you have any questions? Yeah, very good uh, comparison and an introduction into diamonds. What would you say from your point of view is the main main difference between beacons and diamonds if, if there can be made a comparison i mean they they try to solve different different problems yeah. basically so it's um as as i pointed out they they have a similar structure in some in some regards but they they basically have different uh they they are different solutions for different problems so 
Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, Perfect. Thank you very much. That was that was really cool. And uh, yeah, I guess that was today's Share Friday then, unless anyone yeah. has any other questions. Um, I have a question. So um, sure. do you see like, okay, um, so if we implement either like a bacon standard or a diamond standard, mm -hmm. um, and you also talked about merging them. So what's the benefits of like merging? And also like if we try using this in our implementation, do you see any security concerns with with uh, using this pattern? Mm -hmm. um, okay, to the first one, um, like like with, when I when when you combine both of them, um, they try to to solve their problems individually, but you combine basically. So so you could say. Um, how can I combine multiple contracts into a single one and avoid storage collision and upgrade a lot of contracts, like a lot of modules at the same time? That, that's basically the, um, the like, like what a combination of both of them wants to, to uh, solve. So if, if we think about it, um, it would mean we have a diamond structure um, that has a lot of modules. And because the diamond structure itself is is repeatedly like in effect is produced in a factory, right? So it it it's used in in a lot of different cases. Um, uh, th then we discover a bug in one of the modules, and instead of like fixing one diamond at a time, we fix all of the diamonds at once. That's basically the use case here. Um, yeah. So on on the other side, uh, security wise. I think um, it comes down to uh, um, who can create modules or not. Because um, if you you basically, the moment the control flow goes into one of the modules, the module itself is the holder of the, of the diamond address. And that, that basically implies a lot of things, right? So, so I could go and say, Okay, I'm gonna now. Uh, I'm now gonna uh, send a message to to I don't know. I don't know some some contract, and because I'm the I'm the diamond contract address, I could transfer all my funds to that to that one because it's always delegate call into the modules, right? Um, so I think that's the main that's the main point that I found was um, yeah pretty challenging. Or should be kept an eye upon. So you have to trust and control the modules that are implemented, basically. Um, and maybe the possible solution would be to use the multi seek as the owner address. Mm, no, the, the the problem arises with. Um, if you if you basically include a module like you you want to include functionality into it um but you can't trust that functionality then the whole system is corrupted basically already um because if somebody wants to call this corrupt um, functionality uh, because it's part of the main contract everything is fucked up basically yeah I think there is there is a, a difference in the security aspect that if you, as a contract, just call a different contract, there's only so much that the other contract can do. But if, as a diamond, you, you uh, delegate call into a module, the module can can do with you, your storage, and your, your funds in the main contract, whatever it wants. So you it, really it, have to trust these. Yeah, it has absolute control over the state at that point. Yeah. Which is fine if you control the modules and are very diligent about their implementation and gatekeeping who can add new modules and stuff. But yeah, it, it has to be kept in mind, of course. 
I think um, maybe more of an annoyance or um, like a like a feature you could say is the is the way the the storage is structured. Obviously, because it um, it has a lot of differences. Um, like if if we look into one of the modules, uh, you you basically instead of using local variables or state in here, you have this structure that you always have to implement. So it's a bit bit of overhead in the in that position. Um, yeah, but but I think it's it's pretty easy to implement the module. Like you basically inherit the the stuff and you uh, create this exit function in the state. And then you're already ready to go to um, to be part of the diamond, basically. So in that regard, it's pretty easy to implement. Perfect. Thank you very much, Felix. That was a super cool introduction and actually quite a deep dive into yeah proxies, beacon, diamonds, and everything in between. Even if I personally have already worked with these types of things, it's always super cool to yeah get a very deep dive into things and in some parts a refresher. So that was super useful to all of us. And in one, two or three weeks, depending on how it goes, there will be the next uh, session of the EVM Expeditions or Shay Friday, depending on how it goes. And make sure to tune in next time as well. Thank you. Thank you.